All right, good afternoon, folks. Uh, thank you so much for being with us here on this Wednesday. Uh, welcome to Lifelong Connections, How to Facilitate Open Contact in Foster Care and Adoption. Um, I know we have quite a few folks that are registered for this webinar, um, so I'm going to talk slower and allow folks to be able uh, to trickle on in. Um, so uh, today uh, we have a training, this training is from three to five. Um, the training was approved for CLE credit, uh, so that's very exciting. One credit uh, for general and one credit, or I'm sorry, uh, 0.5 uh, for ethics. Additionally, um, certification um, in adoption law for certification credits. Uh, this webinar is being recorded. That recording will be sent out to all registrants uh, within 24 hours after we end today, um, along with any other materials that our speakers provide us with. Um, and the CLE information. Uh, folks should be able to see some live captioning at the bottom of the screen. If you can't, please let me know and we'll um, try to trouble troubleshoot that uh, for you. Uh, but I did enable that and you might have to just enable it on your end. But again, if you have an issue, please let me know. Um, I think the last house housekeeping matter that we have today is uh, we encourage questions uh, always. All of our uh, panelists and presenters have agreed to uh, give us um, some answers. But if you could put those into the Q&A rather than the chat, that way we can streamline and we can um, address them a little more efficiently. That would be fantastic. Um, but as your questions come up, please pop them in. Uh, we'll address them uh, during if possible and you know at the end uh, if time permits. So I always take a little too long for housekeeping. I'm happy to see you all here. And uh, this, this group uh, warrants no uh, need for any introduction. Once they start speaking, you are gonna see uh, all of the wonderful things that I would say about them. So uh, with that, I am gonna turn it over uh, to Maria Bates. Thank you. Hello everyone. I'm gonna start sharing my screen and hopefully you will be able to see that. Welcome to Lifelong Connections, how to facilitate open contact in foster care and adoption. I am Maria Bates. I am a solo practitioner. Um, I am licensed in Florida and DC, and I am overjoyed to be here with Florida Youth Shine and Florida's Children First. Um, and everybody that you can see will introduce themselves here in a minute. Um, but I will take a second. Um, this is our third in the series of adoption webinars. We started last year um, in July. So in case you haven't been present, I will reintroduce myself. Um, those are my four children, although a few years ago. Um, I have an LLM in business law from Florida State, my JD from Stetson, and my undergrad is in human development. I am an adoptive mom, and I'm an attorney specializing in child welfare and adoption, assisted reproduction, nonprofit and business development, and public policy. Um, and because my undergrad was in human development, I was a social worker first, and I actually am a former agency founder and director. So I've actually written adoption, home studies, supervised child studies, assisted in private adoptions, and uh, numerous things in the child welfare um, arena. So the, uh, I think, let me make sure we want to say um, why we are doing this training before I turn it over to our speakers. Um, as I mentioned, I'm an adoptive parent, but I am also a parent with open adoptions and opening adoptions. And I believe that this is an unbelievably complex arena and that our um, focus should be on keeping children and families whole. Um, and I uh, want to lay out sort of what we're doing today because this is our first time weaving together both legal training and concepts with also panelists. So um, please forgive, forgive us if we are fumble a little bit, but our next step will be introductions by our panelists and our moderator. moderator. Then we will go over about uh, an overview of what open contact and open adoption is. Um, there'll be some panel discussions on purposes and reasons for and the risk of choosing an openness. We will talk about some tools, techniques, and supports, provide some resources, address resolving and reducing breakdowns, talk a little bit about ethics and advocacy, then we'll provide our closing thoughts and do some Q&A. We will also pause at a couple of spaces in the presentation for Q&A. So um, put your comments in and we'll look at them and, we'll, and when we have space, we will address them. This is a very important um, piece for us to discuss. We have um, 
this incredible opportunity here directly from uh, people who are in been involved in the system have open adoptions and they are opening up their worlds to us so they are courageous and we want to make sure that what we do is we listen from a place of learning and not from a place of judgment or scrutiny each of their stories and perspectives which sometimes may be shared components so there's siblings on the panel and they can each have their own individual experience of what is occurring in their lives or what has occurred and we must honor each of the person's stories each of the people's stories so again we invite you to consider this to be a listening zone we want you to ask questions so that you can learn but um, it's always easy from the outside to kind of scrutinize and analyze what they're saying or what we're saying um, and um, and there's always so much more behind the scenes of what we're telling you. So again, we invite you to consider this to be a listening zone. And I'm going to turn this over now to Maria Batista to introduce uh, Florida Youth Shine and our panelists. Great, thank you so much, Maria Bates. Uh, so hi everyone, my name is Maria Batista. I'm so lucky to be here. Um, so a little bit about Florida Youth Shine. We are a youth-led uh, advocacy organization that empowers current and former foster youth to become advocates for all youth in care. Florida Youth Shine was founded in 2005 and we have quickly become Florida's leading youth advocacy organization comprised of current and former foster youth who participate in public policy advocacy to improve child protection and foster care services in both a state and a local level. We have our chapters where we meet locally once a month to engage in advocacy work, educating members on public speaking and making suggestions to be shared with their local community-based care organizations providers, as well as the Department of Children and Family. We also do legislative advocacy work through our youth-centered process, where our youth identify the issues each year that are most important to them, so where they can make laws and share their experiences with us. We have made monumental changes in the last 17 years through the help of our adult supporters and mentors. Florida Yushan members have learned the ropes of chapter leadership and they grow into their roles as youth advocates and they gain incredible opportunities. And most importantly, they gain a family with us at Florida Yushan. We have 14 chapters all across Florida um, and current members who are in foster care or formerly in foster care through the ages of 13 to 24 who advocate to make improvements from the child welfare system. Since 2020, uh, we have moved to a hybrid model with both advocacy efforts virtually and in person. But we are not without our founder um, organization, our parent organization, Florida Children First. And they are a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization that is dedicated to advancing the rights of at risk children, especially those in foster care. We're uniquely positioned as Florida's premier independent advocacy organization, where our mission is to obtain meaningful and sustainable improvements in Florida's child serving systems. So we're so lucky to be underneath Florida Children's First. And I'm so lucky to now be a full-time member of Florida Youth Shine by Florida Children's First, as I was an alumni of Florida Youth Shine, and I learned to share my voice and gain all these leadership skills. And I'm so happy to be uh, moderating this panel with my fellow Florida Youth Shine members um, and share a little bit about their experiences with their adoptions. We hope uh, that this will inform you to help families stay connected and a little bit about me and my history is I am currently 26 years old. I came into the care at the age of nine and I was adopted at 16. And I have older siblings and younger siblings and many other family members that some of them I was able to maintain that contact with and some of them I wasn't able to maintain that contact with after adoption. So now I'm super excited to be here and I'm gonna turn it over to our panelists to introduce themselves and tell us a little bit about your experience staying with your family uh, staying in touch with your family. Sean, would you like to go first? Sure. Hello, everybody. My name is Sean Mitchell. Um, I am 22 years old. I am currently a member of the Nature Coast chapter for Florida You Shine. I'm also a board delegate um, for Florida You Shine. Um, but I just recently moved to Tallahassee and now I'm a part of the Tallahassee chapter. Um, I came into care at the age of three with my younger brother. Um, we were adopted when I was six, um, but I was abused in the home and came back into care when I was nine. Um, I was adopted again at 13. My brother stayed in the first adoptive home um, and I was able to see him for a few years after I came back into care um, through visits um, with uh, the adoptive parents, um, but because they were, because they were at the time trying to get me back. 
Um, but when it was clear that I wasn't going back to the home, the adoptive uh, parents like cut off connection with me and my brother. Um, and even though he's an adult now, um, because he was a couple years younger than me, I still don't have any contact um, with him. Um, and then I found out that my birth mother had um, two other children. Um, so I'm now taking care of them and helping raise them as my own. Thank you, Sean, for being here. Thank you for sharing. I also want to mention, I will be dropping my contact information as well as what are you, Sean's website. So if you have a young person ages 13 to 24 who are interested in joining us, feel free to reach out to me or check out our website. Now I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Byron. All righty. Um, my name is Byron Adams. Um, I am 18 years old um, and I am the former vice president but still active member of our Southwest chapter of Florida Youth Shine. Um, I came into care when I was at the age of three um, and then a second time uh, at the age of 10. And so during that time, I was also, I was still in and out of care with my siblings. Um, once I turned 13, uh, my, my siblings, um, one here today and another one, um, were reunited with my birth mom. Um, and so at that time, I decided on my own to say, hey, this is not something that I want to do. So I'm not going to reunify with my birth mother. Um, and so I start, I decided to stay with the person I am with right now. Um, I was adopted um, two years ago um, on National Adoption Day on November 23rd. Um, and so during that time, um, my mom now has always tried to stay in contact with my birth mother. Um, but it wasn't always, my birth mother wasn't always open to that idea. And so there were many, many ups and downs with that. So you can imagine. Thank you for that, Byron. <laughs> LaShawn, do you want to go ahead and go next? Yeah. Hello, my name is LaShawn Adams. Um, I am 16 years old. I'm also a member of the Southwest chapter of Florida Youth Shine. And I'm also part of the Florida Youth Leadership Academy. Um, Byron is my is my older brother. Uh, we were supposed to get together, uh, but when I was 11, I agreed to go back with my mom with, and with my older sister. Um, that it ended up working out, um, so I ended up coming back into care for a third time in 2019. Um, Byron and I were both adopted by our mom when we were when we weren't living together. I didn't get to see Byron as much as I wanted to. Sometimes I would follow him home after school events which I wasn't supposed to do. <laughs> Great, thank you so much for that, LaShawn. Nikki, last but not least, would you like to go ahead and introduce yourself? Yes, ma'am. Um, I am Nikki Schofield. I am the adoptive mom of Byron and LaShawn, and I was their former foster mom for five years prior to that. We adopted in 2019. Um, I've also fostered and continue to support some of their other biological siblings. I'm a very proud public school teacher and was fortunate enough to always keep the kids enrolled in the same schools during their elementary, middle, and high school years, even when we weren't all living together. And that was a huge help with keeping them connected. I think it's very important to keep in communication with the boys' birth family, but it can be very challenging sometimes. Thank you so much for introducing yourselves and for being here today. Um, I know that some of you who are on this um, webinar have seen these presentations before, and it truly is an honor to have real people sharing their own personal experiences. So thank you again. And as a reminder, let's keep it a listening zone. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen again. As we talk about, um, the overview of what is openness. So first of all, our key goal for the training is to prepare you to facilitate solid open contact relationships in foster care adoption. So I think many of you have recognized that over the last many years, there's a ton of conversation research that's shown the importance of sibling relationships. And certainly in the private adoption community, we've had an explosion of research related to open adoptions. Um, because of the nature of the crisis system, the child welfare, it hasn't always been the norm. Um, and we're seeing a more focus on this. So again, we hope when you leave here that you're gonna have some 
information, some materials, some thoughts, some considerations, and some experiences to take back to your teams or to your agencies or your organizations to help you really begin to, to prepare for more solid open contact. So one of the things I talk about when I train on open adoption is that it's much like a marriage, right? So in a marriage, we are joining two bio non-biological people and families. And so if we want whole children, we have to help them understand themselves, their histories and experiences, and offer them opportunities for connection. You know, because when we put children in temporary homes, sometimes that temporary becomes permanent or even that temporary stays temporary, but it still is somewhat permanent in their lives. And um, just by putting them in those temporary homes or eventually permanent, it doesn't stop or sever, it shouldn't sever the connection with their biological family or to other biological siblings, foster siblings, or former caregivers. So some of you may not even have an understanding of what open contact or open adoption is. So just a kind of brief overview here, there it, it exists really on a continuum from closed to semi-open to open. So for a long time, adoption was considered to be completely closed, meaning there was no contact. The biological family had no idea who the adoptive family was and vice versa. And there was absolutely no sharing of information, pictures, visits, or anything of that nature. But in today's world, that really doesn't exist anymore. So I know if you're on social media, you will see somebody pops up and says, new friend request, and it's somebody in your contacts or facial recognition software or DNA um, you know, uh, advances where people are really being able to connect and find out who each other are. And certainly research is showing us that, that open contact is, is very beneficial to our families and kids. Openness uh, on the semi-open realm is where there's an, an intermediary. So somebody who sits in the middle to help facilitate the contact and they usually send pictures and letters through this secure intermediary. And fully open is um, anything from, you know, uh, to, you know, everybody should know each other. That's the first part. So fully open adoption is that people know who the other parties are. And these um, contacts can be letters, pictures, visits, supervised visits, overnights, vacations, you know, connecting by phone, text, FaceTime, and social media friends. So it runs the gamut of what's available to you, and it becomes a personalized decision because open adoption is not one size fit all. It is an individualized process, even siblings, right? So I've talked about that I am an adoptive parent, open adoptions, or I have siblings, some of my kids are very, very open and some of them are not very open, even though they may share the same birth mom, right? So it's every child is allowed to experience it in their own way and every family can decide how that will look, right? But there is no meaning, one meaning. Um, and just because we use words like foster caregiver or adoption does not mean that they aren't part of a child's family, right? So we really have to begin to expand our concept of what family is, just like that marriage concept where we are connecting to non-biological peoples and families and building a family so too we can do that in the world of adoption. Sometimes um, one of the things that we see is that fear is the root of the decisions. So sometimes people say, I don't want to, I don't, you know, I think this is bad for the child or, you know, they're going to have, um, this is going to affect them negatively. But sometimes when you peel apart the layers underneath that is really just fear. And sometimes that's fear of just the unknown, what could happen. Um, and Open adoption is not a one-time event. You don't open the door and then it's completely open. It can change over time. It requires work over time, just like a marriage. Um, and sometimes for, you know, when we're helping children or adults who were adopted identify what kind of openness they want, um, sometimes they want questions answered. Sometimes they want deep relationships. And sometimes when we open that door, um, we, it ends, you know, sometimes it ends a lifelong journey for certain questions to be answered. And sometimes it opens up for recovery. Sometimes there's new round of struggles, but it doesn't just happen one time. And this is a really important message. Um, and I put down here in the resources, which when you all get the slides, you'll see, cause it's super fine print now, but this is one of my absolute favorite books. And it is called 20 things adopted kids wish their adoptive parents knew. It's 
it's been around for a while and it is one of my absolute favorite adoption related books. And certainly for me, one of the lessons I learned was that choosing to be open. So if a child says, I want to know more about my birth family, I want to have relationship with my siblings. I want to, that it doesn't negate your role. If you're the adoptive parent, it doesn't, it's not a choice one over the other. It can be expansive. So some resources listed there, but I just wanted to give you sort of an overview of the what we're talking about here in this training. And now I'm gonna hand it over to Maria Batista to start our first panel discussion. Perfect, thank you so much, Maria Bates. Uh, so LaShawn, as you heard all that Maria, uh, Maria Bates has talked about, we're gonna go over to you. Um, so after you returned to your birth mom, you were able to stay in touch with Byron the way that you wanted to. And what did you do about that? Um, I was not able to see him uh, as much as I wanted to. Um, our birth mom was not happy that Byron didn't come home when I did, and she didn't want me to see him. Uh, sometimes I would call Byron home uh, after the school, even though I wasn't supposed to. Uh, I just wanted to, to be with him and, and my mom. So. Well, I'm glad that you're with him now. How did that make you feel when you couldn't be with him when you wanted to? Uh, it made me feel like I was not in control of my own life. Um, it was like people were making decisions for me, um, but wouldn't give me a, a, a reason as to why. Uh, I became very angry and destructive. Um, I wasn't being very responsible at school or at home um, and just couldn't really find anybody that I trusted or could confide in. Um, and I, I felt really frustrated. I'm so sorry about that. Um... LaShawn, it says in the chat that they can't hear you. If you could say that again, maybe just a little bit louder. Yeah. Um, it made me feel feel like I wasn't in control of my own life. Um, it was like people were, it was like people were making decisions for me, um, but wouldn't give me a, a reason as to why. Uh, I became very just very angry and destructive. Um, I was able to, I was being irresponsible at school um, or at home and couldn't really find anyone that I trusted or confide in. Um, and I felt really frustrated. I can only imagine. Thank you for that, LaShawn. Now, Byron, over to you. How did it make you feel when you couldn't talk to LaShawn or your other family members? Oh, why, yes, thank you. Um, for the time that I couldn't speak with my younger siblings, um, I was pretty heartbroken. Um, knowing that I wasn't able to see both my younger siblings was really hard. Um, I always had to think to myself that um, my siblings were strong and that they would be able to face the hardships even without me. Um, in addition to that, I had to think positively, even though that I'm not there, um, that they would be safe until I do get to see or speak with them whenever that would have been. Um, I think these thoughts that I had um, at the age of 13, um, shouldn't be some that um, a 13 year old kid should have to speak about or think about, excuse me. Um, and so now at the age of 18, um, it is even more heartbreaking to know um, that my siblings and I had to go, go through something like that. Um, so that's really um, what I felt about the entire scenario. Gotcha, oh, understandable. Especially at 13, it's a very young age. Now, follow-up question, Byron, were there times when your birth mom tried to stop you from being in touch with your members of your family? How did that make you feel and what did you do about it? Yeah, um, after my brother and sister went back into custody with my birth mom, um, my daughter's mom um, and I always tried to schedule get-togethers with them so that we can have some sort of normalcy. Um, and so although we try to schedule little play dates with my siblings and I, um, we excuse me, my birth mother never allowed me to be in contact with them um, or us. Um, and so knowing this, um, we, we were both devastated. Um, I too am certain that during these times um, that we reached out, it hurt their feelings as well, knowing that they wouldn't be able to see me or to see my mom. And so it kind of led a downhill a path. And so my brother, as he said prior, um, he would literally run away from school and follow me to my mom's school, which she's a teacher at, um, and just stay there because he missed me and her. And so once he did this, and um, it wasn't just once, it was multiple times. And so um, when he did this, we knew how much he missed hanging out with me and her. 
and how starved he was for attention. Oh, I understand. As someone who's a middle child and I have my older brother and my younger sisters, you just always worry about them when they're even there, they're not there with you. So thank yeah. you that, for that. Sean, you want to go ahead and tell us a little bit about your experience? Yes. Um, so for me, it was um, a little different. Um, my adoptive family um, like made it sound like that my, like my bio family didn't want to talk to me um, and made it sound like that they were too consumed with um, drugs and like alcohol that they didn't want to pay attention to me and like that I didn't matter to them. Um, and then when I did get contact with um, my birth family, they, my family made me feel like really guilty um, and like I, like I wasn't good enough for them. Like, like they weren't made it, tur like turned it around to where it was said, like I wasn't appreciative of what, of everything that they were doing. Um, so it made me feel really guilty to where I didn't want to have contact with them. And I didn't want to share like that side of me. Um, even though my entire life I had searched for that and um, wanted uh, my bio family in my, in my life. Thank you for sharing that, Sean. I love my adoptive parents so much, but I don't want, I don't want to be made feel guilty that I want to have that connection with my birth family. So I, I understand that perspective because you are going to have those connections with that. So thank you for that. Now, Nikki, over to you. Your boys have talked about how they felt when they were kept apart from family members, and you've talked about how important it is to keep them connected. Can you tell us a little bit about some of the risks of an adoption? Yes, absolutely. Um, so my biggest concern has always been the risk of hurt feelings and disappointed children. Um, my boys are the sweetest, most thoughtful young men I've ever met. And for years, they've gotten their hopes up and have more than not been let down by their birth mother and some of their um, birth family. For instance, Byron just graduated weeks ago and his bio mom declined to give me her new address so that I could send her an invite. Um, I did get it from a mutual friend and she decided to ignore it, yet showed up unannounced five hours late and stayed for only 20 minutes not greeting me once. Um, it can be definitely emotionally tiring. I put a lot of effort into inviting people to do things and making connections, but sometimes it's not appreciated or reciprocated. Setting boundaries can be challenging. Sometimes it's more than communication, um, family members needing help with things. For instance, Byron and I are on speed dial for their biological sister when she needs a ride to and from work. Um, so we help out when we can, but we can't always help. And it's a challenge to manage and accommodate the multiple households so that everyone feels included. Um, they do have multiple biological siblings. And so when they were younger, when um, they were in separate homes, it was just really hard to facilitate visits. And so we did the best we can but it's hard to get everybody on page. No, thank you for that, Nikki. I appreciate it so much. So thank you to our panelists. We've now reached the portion of questions from the audience. Um, if you have a question, feel free to go ahead and put it in the chat. Okay, so seeing as there are no questions, I'm going to go ahead and give it back to Maria Bates. Um, again, thank you all for sharing that. Um, I certainly heard a lot of um, similar messages, and one of those similar messages is really about the weight of emotions in this process, um, from whether you're trying to keep them from feeling negative feelings, to managing worry and anxiety when there's no contact, to how's it going to work out, um, you know, to uh, feeling pressure to choose one family over another family. So clearly in open adoption, when we, you know, at first began, we talked about this is a complex scenario, right? There's lots of feelings that are wrapped up in this. Um, what I also heard from the panelists was that our, our, our children, our youth find their way, like they will find their own way at some point. And so, um, you know, whether it's waiting till 18 or later in life, there, there is this um, oftentimes desire to know more, 
to what extent they want to know more, um, there is this sense of wanting to know more and they'll find a way to, to get some of their questions answered. Um, so we're now going to, to shift over to techniques and tools and supports for openness and we'll open that up again with panel discussion. Perfect. Thank you so much, Maria Bates. So a question to all panelists. Did anyone discuss open adoption with you uh, or offer any help in navigating these relationships? This could be a gal, a caseworker, an adoption worker, or anyone in the child welfare system. And then question also is, and since you are still in the midst of things, would it be helpful for assistance going forward? We'll start with Nikki. Um, I haven't gotten any help navigating these relationships. It's been all trial and error that the boys and I have figured out on our own. It would definitely be helpful um, to have people who can help us figure things out. Um, my family and friends have given support the best way they could, but I think each foster and adoptive situation is as unique as a fingerprint. I think that's why open communication is so important because our foster training can only cover so much. As different situations arise, we need to be able to bounce them off one another. Going forward, I think it would be nice if case managers and support staff felt valued and appreciated enough to stay so that each month fosters aren't having to learn and maneuver someone new on the case plan. With that, I'm disappointed with the amount of threats I received from various people on the case plan. Every time the boy's sister would choose to leave my home, case managers would threaten to take LaShawn too. They would say, well, we have to keep the siblings together. And it was said in a threatening tone like punishment towards me that she had opted to move out yet again, five times total. All the while I knew though that LaShawn wasn't going anywhere because until adoption, I had permanent guardianship of Byron. So no one was going anywhere. LaShawn was always with his sibling, the one he chose to be with. Great, thank you so much, Nikki. Uh, now, Byron, over to you. Did anybody talk about the open adoption with you? Well, no. Um, is Piggybacking off what my mom was saying, um, we didn't really have much help at all. Um, it was always just me and her bouncing ideas off of each other. Um, and so I do think that um, if there was someone who specifically specialized in like knowing the ins and outs of like adoption slash permanent guardianship, it would have saved a lot of stress and headaches compared to having to navigate it ourselves. Um, and so there wasn't much we could have done, but I think we did the best with the cards that we had. No, understandable. I know prior to this, we were talking about the difference between adoptions and permanent guardianships and just how confusing it is. And for folks who don't work on it every day, it is hard. So thank you for that, Byron. Now, Sean, over to you. Did anybody have these conversations with you about an open adoption? They did not. Uh, my mom was the only one who, um, who helped me. Um, no. Um, when I was uh, younger, uh, excuse me. Um, excuse me. Um, but there wasn't anybody when I was younger that, that would help me um, at at home. Um, there was. I wish there was. I wish there was somebody um, that was there to be a role model um, for me um, to teach me um, certain things that I had no clue about. Um, now, going forward, it'd be nice if more other parents would consider open, adop open adoption. Thank you for that. And yes, I'm so glad you have uh, Byron as your role model now as someone who's going to USF this fall and we're super excited for his accomplishments. Now, over to you, Sean. Uh, did anybody talk to you about the open adoption process? Um, no, nobody did talk to me about the open adoption process. Um, my GAL um, tried really hard to get my brother out of that home um, and keep us together, but she just wasn't able to, um, but she fought really hard um, for us to stay in touch. Um, and then I think going forward, something that um, would help is is having like having the conversations with the parents about having 
um, the open adoption, I just feel like um, not only would it be beneficial to the child, but it would also be beneficial to the bio family because they also get to learn what it's and see like what it's like to have their child in a in a healthy environment and like they can learn like okay I shouldn't do this I can do this with the child like and if they have further like more children later on like they'll be able to keep them and um, learn from their mistakes from the first time. I love how you mentioned uh, children and siblings. You know, it's important when one child gets adopted that the siblings at least know where that child is going so that way you can have those sibling connections. So thank you so much for my panelists for answering that. I'm gonna go ahead and turn it back over to Maria Bates. Take me off mute. Okay, and back to our PowerPoint. So, um, as we were preparing for this, it kind of came up with lots of considerations and issues. Um, and maybe these are questions, we don't have answers to every single one of them. We have some thoughts on it, but ultimately these are common issues or considerations that can come up. Um, so one of them is when one birth parent wants openness, but the other doesn't. So, um, and that sort of goes hand in hand with the second, which is when grandparents or siblings want open, but birth parents don't, or some person doesn't want openness. So, you know, one of the, um, one of the most important parts of developing a really solid open relationship is learning how to communicate with each other. And so when something comes up, the adults can talk about it and the youth can talk about it and they can get support and talk about what does this mean to them um, and recognize, for example, that if one doesn't want to choose open, that it's um, not another layer of abandonment feeling, right? So adoptive parents, foster parents often, you know, keep things closed from the fear that our kids are going to feel abandoned again if one doesn't have, uh, one doesn't want contact and another one does, right? So one of the things I um, try to, to help people understand is that, you know, we really do have to meet people where they are, right? And that everybody has a different capacity. So I always talk about, you know, my dad who was gone for my life for, for a significant time that he was not a good day in, day out dad. Right. So I didn't count on him in those ways, but I count on him for some things that were valuable to me. So when you can have open communication and you can talk to others about what these concerns or issues or what's underlying one person's reasons not to be in contact and another person's to stay in contact, you might get to a fear that can be addressed or you might find a way for there to be some limited amount of contact or something that feels good to everyone. Either way, what is most important is to get it out on the table and let people talk about it. Um, another issue that comes up is what info is actually shared. So do you share full names and addresses? And I have worked with families who've had extreme circumstances whereby you, they were really afraid, right? So they were, um, and oftentimes this is right around termination of parental rights or right after termination of parental rights or what, after an adoption is finalized. And, and, and birth parents are still, and birth families, if, they, um, if the children are being adopted, aren't comfortable and ready for this next phase. In fact, they are, were adamant that this not happen. And so there is, to one extreme, this real fear that they're gonna come knocking on your door and trying to get your children. But research has shown that that's often a big myth that occurs, that this is extreme circumstances. So you do wanna thoughtfully go into it, but you don't want to base uh, you know, this kind of a big decision on a very small percentage of possibility. So most of the time when we have families in open contact, fully open contact, sharing names and addresses is part of that process. It's part of your comfort. It's part of acknowledging and recognizing that children are now in a big extended family, not just the adoptive family and not just the birth family, but one big extended family. And that also includes, you know, developing those relationships. And it's hard to do that when you're not sharing of that information. Um, what is shared with extended family and friends is a really big topic in the field of adoption, generally speaking, anyhow, because we want to be uh, thoughtful about what we're sharing. Because once you share some information, it's out into the world, out into the universe, and it's hard to get that back, right? And so, 
um, I obviously train on adoption and I talk about my family, but there are limits to what I talk about. And I talk to my kids about that. And so there's with a sort of a common rule in adoption we call precious and private. So there are things, um, sometimes people come from a place instead of being precious and private to hold it near and dear to your heart and not share it. They come from a place of adoption is shameful. And so they close down from not sharing from that perspective. What we want to do is get to the place of not sharing too much from the precious and private place, not from the shame-based place, okay? But keep in mind that all of your extended family, so for an adoptive family, their extended family, who is not living the day in, day out, will probably not fully understand what you are going through. And they may make significant judgments about what you're doing and or the, the your kids' biological family members, right? So I can see somebody who is struggling with substance, substance abuse and still see the good in them, right? Find the gold nuggets in them, develop the contact there, even if they are actively using. It doesn't make them horrible, terrible people, right? It does mean that there's some boundaries that maybe need to be in place and there's some understanding needs to happen around that. But again, your extended family and friends may not really fully get that. So there are things you may only decide to share amongst maybe your community, your adoption community, right? This is also why it's unbelievably important for us to connect our, our kids with each other directly, right? So it's not just an attorney, a case manager, a guardian, you know, an adult kind of us speaking down to our youth. It's them talking to other youth who either in the same place or been in the same place as them to help them navigate some of these, you know, conversations and questions and issues. Um, I know I mentioned the, the drug use, but some people absolutely use drug use, criminal activity and, um, as ways to shut it down. And so there are reasons why you would limit or shut down communications, but keep in mind that the goal of this is to keep your child whole, right? To have your child have a whole experience that allowed them to make choices about the people important to them. To have us help our kids learn healthy boundaries and what does that mean? Right. So we can't change if somebody is an, is an addict or they have a criminal history past. What we can do is help navigate and help them understand what relationships can look like moving forward. If there's a fear factor around being used, for example. Um, so you can create secure connections in that realm. And sometimes maybe that comfort level is the semi open where we talked about there's an intermediary involved, you use a technology system, you use an attorney, you use an agency to share pictures and letters, or some contact if someone's actively, you know, not, not in a great space. Um, and so, but that doesn't have to fully limit your openness, you can still maintain openness. Um, how to help your clients be realistic with openness, right? So um, sometimes it's, you know, we can be sort of pie in the sky, right? People look at me and they're like, how do you, yeah, you can't advocate for that, right? I have a very, really, really fully open adoption, right? So my younger kid's birth mom is actively involved in her life. We've had lots of ups and downs over the time, but like, you know, two of my kids are with her hanging out today while I'm doing this webinar. And, uh, you know, we have that level of openness. So I know open adoptions can be really, really open. They're very complex and they're not always easy, but they can be really open, right? So I don't want to sit here and say, um, be realistic and, you know, and be pragmatic in a way that shuts it down. But I also want you to think about those um, navigating relationships, learn, understanding boundaries, learning to accept somebody for where they are in their lives right now, seeing the gold inside of them, even when their behaviors on the outside aren't always perfect, right? Just like our kids, right? So our, we have generational foster care is absolutely, you know, a thing that happens. And so learned experiences and behaviors and traumas over generations and generations still exist there. So we have to see that gold in, in the other people. So I still am going to have a pie in the sky, but I think a lot of some people may have some other experiences they're going to share in a bit um, in reaction to what I'm saying about openness that may be a little bit more realistic. Um, issues and considerations visits. So how often, what is done, who pays for them? What happens when you live in different places? Are you as the adoptive parent always you know, taking your kids across the coast to see their um, siblings or their birth family? Is the other family not reciprocating that? Um, so 
my encouragement is really to, again, step outside to try and see it from their view, their perspective, so that you can come together and make something work for both of you, right? So how often sometimes is, you know, a scheduled visits because that makes it clear for everybody, but sometimes people need it to be fluid. So when you can develop real relationships and not just a checklist of, oh, you have a visit for two hours every two weeks, and it's truly a relationship that's built between the people, then it becomes, you, you can allow for more fluidity and real, um, you know, so if a, a child is sick, for example, and you need to, to move the visit, the other party is not, you know, angry all the time because, oh, maybe you're just manipulating, you don't want the child to see me and things like that. Because if you have a real relationship, you can see, oh, well, yeah, they really are sick and we'll reset this up another time. So again, visits, how often what is done, who pays for them is up for discussion. And that's something you will want to navigate with, with you know, everybody involved. Um, and I encourage everybody to start with sort of what works for you. Um, when you have more than one child with different types of open contact. So we have complex adoptive families and foster families, right? And so we may have a child who has very open relationships and we have a child who doesn't have open relationships. So again, we come back to the core of talk about it. Don't just let it sit in the background, actually communicate. Well, how does that feel? What, what does that look like for you? You know, what's something we can do to support you? Um, social media issues, and we will open this up. I know somebody had a, a question in the chat about this, but um, again, social media, right, has taken, you know, full stage in our lives, right? In this generation, we are on social media all the time, and um, something that comes up is who owns the rights to share about my child, right? So do you allow others to share pictures of your child, what is said about your child? Um, do you talk to your child? So if you have teenagers, for example, this is a great conversation to have with them, right? You should already be having conversations about social media because it's happening anyhow. At school, even our kids that don't have phones or don't have access to it, their friends do. It's happening at school. And so it's a, a, a topic of conversation. So, uh, you know, I've, for me personally, I, it's been open. So if their mom, their other mom, birth mom um, wants to share, she does. But other families say, you know what, this is it. Here's our rule about it. We don't want this to share. So we're going to have, we want to have an open relationship, but we're really concerned about privacy and what is out there in the world on our children. So again, discuss it with everybody involved. Um, negotiating an open contact agreement. We're going to talk about this a little bit later when I describe what that would look like, but ultimately you can actually have a written agreement about this. And, and it's, I encourage it because you're sort of laying out your goals and intentions. Um, and we'll talk about the floor statues related to these contact agreements um, later on in the, in the presentation. What happens when your court the court case manager therapist co-parent does or does not support open adoption. Well, let me first say that if you go under chapter 39, which is our dependency statute in Florida, and you look at the whole chapter and you do a search for the word sibling, it's gonna come up 270 times. Well, this has not always been the case, but it certainly is now. And what we have seen is a real openness towards recognition, how important sibling relationships are as a priority and extended relatives as well, right? So um, I think it was Byron who said, he spoke directly to the judge and said, this is what I want, right? I have worked with lots of families I've represented and it is oftentimes the young person who says to the judge, I want to talk to my sister. I want to have a relationship with my grandparent or whatever that is. So we certainly want to encourage our youth who are currently in the system to advocate to the court, I want to be heard. They have a right to be heard. And they can say this is important. If they have an attorney, and their attorney can be advocating for them. Guardians can advocate through the program, right? Therapists can absolutely do this. But sometimes and what I see is that still there's a lack of support for it, right? Because there is this negative view that if a bio parent is losing their rights, if their rights are being involuntarily terminated, they should have no contact with their kids, right? So there is an underlying bias that still exists in our society about open adoption and the fears that come along with this. So um, I would certainly encourage all of the agencies in DCF and the Guardian program to 
do more trainings on this, provide research, put together the library on open adoption, you know, get this book I'm telling you about, read it. It's such an easy read so that they're educated about it, right? So just because we say we have an adoption qualified therapist or adoption competent therapist does not mean they fully get it. And certainly sharing this training is unbelievably valuable because you are hearing right from the people who are living those experiences. Um, how open is too open? This is always a conversation. And usually it comes from a fear place. Like, is it a co-parenting relationship? Again, my, my recommendation is that you look at what works for your specific family. This is an individualized assessment. Legally, when an adoption occurs, all legal rights go to the adoptive family and the biological parents' rights are terminated or the formal legal parents' rights are terminated. So from a legal perspective, it is the adoptive parents' decision on what happens. But it doesn't mean that you can't build such a solid relationship. There is factors that are like, I talked to my kids' birth mom and asked, you know, well, what do you think about this? That's okay to do. It's not me giving up any rights, right? And in fact, she brings a wealth of knowledge of things that I don't think about, right? It's another person that's valuable to your child. Um, planning for a lifetime of openness. Again, we said earlier that this is not a one-time occurrence. Openness happens over 30, 50 years and generations to come. If we start he having recovery and healing, by instead of cutting off family relationships, by expanding our view of what family is, then we will help support this, you know, stopping of the generational foster care that occurs, right? Because the trauma that can happen by cutting off contact, what is not necessary, right, hurts. It hurts everybody involved. I think you've heard from LaShawn Byron and Sean, right? There's all of these feelings that go along with it. So let's get it out on the table and let's talk about it. And it is a lifetime. Um, and then we talked about there's opening up contact after adoption. So I'm going to walk you through a process in a little bit that will talk a little bit how we do that. Um, and certainly where I see it as an attorney is contested cases and visits, right? So we've had a child who's been visiting with certain people and then all of a sudden it's completely shut down because somebody inside the system has said it's, it's you know, this is, it shouldn't be occurring. Well, my view on it is let's stop and pull out the dynamics of war, right? This does not have to be adversarial here, right? Even though the system is set up this way and let's step it back and see how does this child view this situation, right? So if this child has all of this contact and all of a sudden it's completely cut off, the agency allowing that to be cut off is causing trauma, is causing harm. There's a great law review article, if anybody wants it, I will send it to you, that talks about the harm of removal itself. And there is a harm in a just absolute, complete cutting off of contact. So what we should be looking at in the midst of these contested cases is through the eyes of this child, right, or these kids, what have they experienced, right? What do they see? And how can we help set it up for a lifetime of success? Okay. So I think, Maria, catch me if I'm wrong here, we are now moving over to a little um, techniques and tools um, for the panelists, or for the panelists to open us up for cute question and answer about all of those things I just said. They are absolutely 100% allowed to say, Maria, you have it wrong. We think something different. Or yes, that really works. Um, and look, before I hand that over, I do want to mention one thing. We have briefly said something about permanent guardianship. And I just want to say that I said to you earlier that when an adoption occurs, there is a legal transfer of parental rights. But our system works, you know, not just strictly in the world of adoption. We have complex scenarios like permanent guardianship, right? We have long-term, you know, um, kids being in care for several years, as you've heard from some of the panelists, right? Where termination parental rights has occurred or has not occurred. And if the termination parental rights hasn't occurred, that makes it even far more complex, which we do not have time in this training to get you know, into the, to the weeds about. Um, but it does make it more complex when we have gray areas of who has rights and who doesn't have rights. And permanent guardianship can be very hard on 
all the people involved, including the birth parents who can't sort of let go and move on to the next life, right? So um, I just wanna mention that and I'm gonna hand it over, I'm gonna stop sharing and let um, our, our panelist first comment before we open the floor up for Q and A. So those of you watching, this is your chance also to throw in your, your questions. Great, thanks for that, Maria Bates. I love how you mentioned eyes of the child and you know, go from the case from there. I think that is very important to be, you know, you centered. So panelists, all that you heard uh, that Maria Bates just listed out about tools and techniques, do you have any reactions that she that brought up from what you had heard? Nikki? I wanted to, well, I just wanted to add a little bit. Um, so we only have communication with um, one of the boys' bio parents. Um, and that's, sometimes that's, and sometimes that's very common, but um, the other has been incarcerated for most of their lives and with no contact. Um, it will soon expire, actually, um, next year in 2023. Um, I hope at that point that the boys um, do decide to stay away. Um, because I just don't know that there is anything productive that their bio dad can offer to their lives. Um, with that, though, I keep in touch with three aunts and grandma on their paternal side, um, and I would never place blame on them for his shortcomings, a challenge we have had over the years. Um, and this kind of makes me think about social media a little bit. Um, but when the boys have visited um, with their bio mom and they've been out and about like Walmart or Publix um, with their bio mom, um, I'll hear from loved ones and friends that have run into them that um, the boys just act like shells of themselves and they're not their normal go lucky, um, you know, young people. Um, and it's always bothered me because the boys can't explain why they're doing that. Um, and Byron is not interested in this with his birth mom when I'm not present. Um, but LaShawn does enjoy time alone with his birth mom. And she now lives on the other side of the country. And he just spent a week with her. And that was great. Um, going back to the social media, though, it is a challenge because when that does come up, we see lots of stuff like number one mom, number one son. And it is, I think, confusing for those outside of our family to understand. Um, but we're very open with posting things when the boys are out with their friends and their parents. We, we always say, you know, this is my bonus brother. And so I have lots of, you know, bonus sons and bonus daughters. Um, so just best friends of the kids. And so just as they share with um, the boys on, on Facebook and post on Facebook, that's a okay. But it does, people always ask about social media when they see those things come up. Thank you for that, Nikki. Got uh, two questions and the answers out of you. Um, rest of the panel, Byron, LaShawn, Sean, did anything that Maria talked about with techniques uh, and tools bring up anything that you wanted to mention? Nothing, yeah, nothing. Yeah, nothing for me either. Okay, so thank you all uh, for sharing so bravely. I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to question and audience. And the first question I have here is, if you remember, um, Byron and LaShawn, or if Nikki, if you remember, did the boys have an attorney at Vitam or an attorney at all while they were in care? So we loved our adoption attorney, but until meeting her in 2019, um, and really it was just um, a little bit, of, a couple of conversations prior to our adoption date, uh, we didn't have, um, an attorney, we would see the guardian at litem attorney when we went to court and she was amazing and her name escapes me um, right now. Um, but we never met with any attorneys or talked to any other than just firming up paperwork and, um, you know, changing the boys' names or um, things like that. So no support. Great, okay, thank you for that, Nikki. And Sean, what about you? Do you remember if you had an attorney at litem or an attorney of some sorts? Um, I do not recall any of that from my case. Perfect. Thank you guys so much. Um, I'm not seeing any other questions in the chat. Maria, so I'm going to, let me just right. end it for a second. So let me, I, I probably, most of you who are watching understand the difference between an attorney ad litem and a guardian ad litem, right? We work in the system, but you know, one of the 
biggest benefits. I mean, I would love for there to be both for every kid in care, right? So one of the benefits of attorney ad litem as it relates to this level of contact and openness is that the attorney ad litem is responsible to go to court and discuss the child and advocate for the child's express wishes, right, for what they want. And so we've already heard from three of our panelists who were youth adopted from the system or youth in the system who say, it's not easy to stand up and say, I want contact or I don't want contact or what, whatever that is, you know, for is. And the research, like I was even expressing to you from the book perspective, what we know is that our kids, right, and I say our kids as um, an adoptive parent, right, my kids, you know, sometimes focus more on making sure they're protecting me than advocating for what they want. So this is what is so beneficial for having an attorney in light. And it's not that the guardian program can't advocate for that. But the attorney ad litem, but there's that filter of perception of best interest there, right? Whereas the attorney ad litem actually could express the exact the child's actual wishes. Now that is not me as a representative of Florida Children's Fourth Florida Youth Shine or any other problem that's me, Maria Bates Law, my practice saying my views on why I think the attorney ad litem is beneficial here. Um, and we do have another question, I think, in the, the Q&A, um, which was, how did the adoptive parents handle the no contact in the TPR final order post-adoption? Are they inclined to ignore it after the adoption is finalized or use it to prevent a child from reach, reaching out to the buyer parent? Um, I'm a parent's attorney who fought to have language included to allow contact, but haven't had much success. I am going to talk to you about mediated settlement agreements in a little bit and help you think that through and how you can advocate it, um, advocate for it in the process. But um, I don't know, Nikki, if that was, if you want to talk about that as part of yours, um, is there, was there the no to contact? I know you mentioned that you had a no contact order as to the father. So we do, there's a, a no contact order that, um, will expire in 2023. Um, no, no, I'm wrong. It'll expire in 2024. Um, so he, he will be out of um, jail in 2023 and it will expire for, for LaShawn in 2024 when he turns 18. So in fact, um, now that Byron and some of the older siblings um, are of an age to consent, then they can in fact um, visit with him once he is released from um, prison. But Byron has held very firmly for many, many years that that is not something that he desires um, to do. I don't know if that answers the question though. That's just our experience. Yeah, I think that's what they're asking is what is your experience? So. So thank you for that, uh, Nikki. Did we have any other questions? I see in the chat, attorney at items aren't always, aren't always available in my experience as a gal. Even when I have requested one as a medicated child on a site with a psychiatric doctor, I found working with attorney at items to be extremely helpful in some cases. So I think that's it for questions at this time. So we'll turn it back over to you, Maria Bates. All right, let's see, back to sharing my screen. Okay, so I just referenced this idea of um, mediated uh, settlement agreements and PACA, which um, stands for Post-Adoption Contact Agreement. So I mentioned to you before that agreements can be put in place, um, both preferably before termination happens, which is done a lot of times in the world, the private adoption world. What we see, what I see, at least from an attorney's perspective and finalizations is that there's been a, a mediated settlement agreement um, at the time of um, consents or TPR by, uh, by either the foster parents or, uh, you know, um, the agency on behalf of future prospective adoptive parents and the biological parents. So one agreement per parent, depending on what the circumstances are. I don't see it in every case, but I see it in some. So um, 
this is, you are not going to be able to read all of that. I'm going to high, highlight a couple areas, but I want you to have the Florida statute that talks about these agreements. So it's Florida statute 63.0427. So for those of you who don't live in the adoption world all the time, when we have a dependency case, it's chapter 39. And then we move over to chapter 63, which is the adoption statute to finalize the adoption. This is a statute related to agreement for continued communication and contact between a job child and siblings, parents, and other relatives. And this is what the, the well, and it's the only place, it's the only place that there is in fact teeth, although there's um, not sharp, sharp teeth, but there's some teeth here, right, in these agreements. So a child, and I'm um, just focusing on the highlighted, shall have the right to have the court consider the appropriateness of post-adoption communication or contact. You can see that the court will make certain determinations regarding that. And this will be incorporated into the final adoption order. However, at the end of the day, when the legal rights transfer, the adoptive parent still has the responsibility and right to identify what's in their child's best interest. The birth parents, if they have that kind of agreement, could come back to court and say, it's not, this agreement's not being followed and uh, address it. I've never seen that actually occur. I don't know if anybody who's watching has seen that actually occur. But I've certainly been in the midst of private adoptions where there's a disagreement or a breakdown in communication between the birth family and the adoptive family, and there's some mediation that, excuse me, that occurs in the process. But that is the statute. When you then move down to DCF regulation 65C-16.020 is where it's codified in our DCF regulations and has a lot more detail about what happens. But you know, there's a tremendous um, number of other types of um, the, you know, uh, expressions in chapter 39 that talk about sibling and relatives. So I don't have them all listed here, but they are um, about family finding, about preference for sibling relationships to be continued. And there's a lot of information, again, some of it's fairly new to the statutes in the last several years um, that's being implemented right now. So this is a golden opportunity for everybody working in the system to kind of step back and take some of these resources and trainings today to back to their team to say, how can we implement this better and go above and beyond what our statute calls for? So again, we have these um, agreements that are can be put in place. So um, what I see a mediated settlement agreement I have seen them very loose. And so uh, what this is in terms of mediated settlement is that the parents are consenting to the termination of their parental rights. And then an agreement is put in place that the um, prospective adoptive parents, which at that time could be the foster parents, right? So at that time, it's an identified foster parent, then they may participate in that mediation and they end up signing the mediated settlement agreement. And it would have language as to how many visits are going to happen, how they're going to maintain contact, what would happen if it breaks down. And ultimately there's a statement that the, the breakdown of the open contact does not uh, um, pull back the termination of parental rights, right? So the termination will go forward regardless. And so they're taking this sort of in that, from that risky perspective. There's always in a statement that this should be incorporated back into the um, final, the, into the termination of parental rights and to the final judgment of adoption. So that's where I see that the system has put together that. I have also represented clients where we have done a motion in order for continued contact. So separate and not required necessarily through a mediated settlement, but be because the family themselves have put this together. And we'll talk a little bit later about how the, the system can, in, you know, enforce these or make sure it's actually getting done. Um, but that's what we call a, you know, a either if there's an agreement between the two parties, it's called a um, PACA um, and uh, the post-adoption com communication agreement or the mediated settlement agreements, or we do a separate motion in order that get in gets incorporated into the final adoption. Let's see. Um, I'm going to show you here in a second some sample forms that I use, but certainly there's tremendous number of books and there's technology out there to support open adoption. So let me stop and talk about um, the process for opening contact um, before we kind of move into how you um, can put teeth to those agreements. So. I want you to um, 
think about, I like this process. I mean, I designed this process and wrote it, but I think about it from oftentimes this is when I'm working with somebody and they've not opened this door, that the open contact does not exist. But even if it already exists, what I recommend is you take this process and see where you're at and what was missed. So if we missed a step, it didn't happen, go back and ask these questions, right? So a reminder that there are many starters in this process. It could be an adoptee as a child or an adult. It could be bio um, parents. It could be bio siblings. It could be foster siblings. So um, my son's, one of his foster siblings is now at college. And she sent me a Facebook friend request um, last year when she started at UCF. And, you know, so we have, you know, we're at least Facebook friends and we see what each other's doing and, you know, all that kind of stuff. So it can be initiated by lots of people. But if we really want to take the steps to help people navigate this, as you heard from our participants early, they would love to have somebody navigate this. The first step would be, do you want to open this door? So what are you looking for? What do you want? What are your hopes? This is unbelievably important. And a lot of times, the first time you ask it, there's not, they're not gonna have an idea, right? They didn't do this before. It's a brand new thing to them. They really have no idea. So this is where conversations, multiple conversations, um, and where the third bullet there, write about it. So have them journal about it, write about it. What is it they're looking for? So you can get through to the essence of what their hope is. So walk through the what ifs. And as a reminder, do not get paralyzed by them, right? So we can, what are what ifs ourselves? all the way into not ever taking a step forward in that direction. I want you to think about the what ifs so that you're prepared for whatever could come, right? That you have navigated some of these, you know, fears because, because if you walk past, like you've gone through that fear and said, well, what if that would have happened? What if you walk in that door, open that door and you open contact and they don't want to talk to you right now, right? Is then you can help them say, well, does that personal to you? I, I don't think so. I think it's personal to them, right? So you can help them navigate that and develop your support system, right? So one thing I suggest to adoptive parents all the time is that have your kids connected with other kids who are also adopted because they may not ever talk to you about these things. They may need to go to somebody else first to talk about it and then kind of come up with a plan about how they're going to talk to you about it. I've unfortunately had to work with people who 10 years, a, a, a person who as an adult, but adopted as a child, kept it from her adoptive family that she had contact with her biological family because she was too afraid about how her adoptive family would feel, right? Imagine living, you know, walking down that line, how hard and painful it is. Now you're keeping those secrets, right? It doesn't feel good. So introduce your kids to other kids who are adopted. Have them have conversations about it. Everybody who's involved in this should be developing their team. So even adoptive parents who aren't opening this should also have their team because you're going to have your whole set of feelings about it. Well, maybe they will like the other parent better, right? I mean, you're going to have those feelings. So support groups, adoption professionals, therapists, that's your team. And then kind of create a tentative plan, right? It's a draft. You can kind of say, okay, well, we're going to do this first. We're going to do this next. And then we're going to do it. And it can be subject to change right? Step two, finding your family. So sometimes people really don't know where to start, right? We have a whole um, group of people in the world who don't have any contact. They have no names. They don't know how to be in touch. So Florida has a voluntary adoption reunion registry, and um, it's amazing the, the, the people who run it and know it, they're, they're great people. Um, and it's, but it's all voluntary. So if you register and the, your biological relative also registers, they will voluntarily connect you. But if only one person registers, another person registers, there is no connection that occurring. But it doesn't hurt to file it anyhow. So if there's somebody you don't know, go ahead and file it, right? Because it'll sit there and hopefully something will come up. You can request non-identifying information from court. You can go to court to unseal your records, which is to receive identifying information. There's very specific parameters about how you would do that. There's certainly very basic searching that happens over the internet. Um, I have looked in voters records for families before. Like I have helped adoptees go through like, okay, we've got this piece of information, this piece of information. And it's amazing what you can find out. 
Um, certainly social media and facial recognition will get to us a lot of places. And there's actually people out there who are uh, private investigators who, who do this work. Um, and they, um, you know, they are experienced in the world of adoption. And then, of course, there's the DNA searches, right? So this is where I tell people for sure, we go back to that conversation, step one, about being prepared for anything, because if you open that up, DNA up, you may find a whole bunch of relatives that you may or may not be ready to have come, you know, knocking on your door or connecting with you. So there's all different layers of what DNA information or research is going to show you, but that is another tool, right? Now, with the Finding, finding Family Statutes, the agencies are supposed to do this, but again, for many people, this hasn't been done and or there's no contact moving forward. And so you're sort of on your own to find your family. Um, step three, reaching out and making contact. So you can go directly, you can go through an intermediary or you can go through a support person, right? You can come up with a, an alias uh, Gmail account. You can come up with, you can get a PO box for, I don't know, 60 bucks a year or something. You can do all kinds of things if you're wanting to maintain some level, more level of control, right? Some people are very comfortable just saying, I think I found them, they're on Facebook. I'm gonna send them a, you know, um, a message. I call, they call them DMs now. I, my kids are just teaching me this. So they slide into the DMs and there all of a sudden you now are talking to your bio mom and boom, everybody knows I'm there laughing at me, but that's okay. Um, but you will make that contact. Step four is integrating this person or persons into your life or not. So you may find you've done a DNA search and all of a sudden you see, and then you look them up on Facebook and you're like, that you know what, this is going to be derailing for my life. I'm not ready to do this. Um, and, you know, or you reach out and then you kind of shut it down um, or you say, okay, you know what, let's schedule a meeting. Let's schedule it in about two or three months. And some people are like, I'll see you tomorrow, right? It depends on who you are, what, you know, wh where you're at in your life. Um, and again, our, our kids, some have very specific questions and just need answers. Others want to build relationships, right? So every kid is different, right? One of my kids, you know, is like, it's fine. I, I don't care, but I don't want to have a, you know, deep, long relationship. Others are like, I want to know everything. I want to know the nitty gritty. I want to know how I got here. I want to know all of that kind of stuff. Every kid is different. Step five, running through the process, albeit in a modified way over your lifetime, right? So it's marriage, it's family, right? We all navigate relationships over the lifetime, right? So our youth are, identifies LGBTQIA+, oftentimes have an experience of being, um, you know, rejected at some point with, with family, and they have to modify that and say, this isn't working anymore, and they create their own family, extended family. And sometimes that opens up again, right? Family, it, it's not a static thing. It goes ups and downs, right? So some stay connected, some don't. Sometimes you meet a relative that you don't want to stay close with right? Sometimes you do. Sometimes they become, you know, your other parent and you begin to navigate, okay, the next part, which is, well, what do I call them? Are you both my mom? Like my five-year-old says he has two moms, right? His birth mom and me. And it's in his world, that's what it is. So you begin to navigate, what will that look like in your world, right? Keep navigating it over time, begin to go back and ask yourself those questions. How do I feel about all this stuff? Once it's on the table, it doesn't mean that you put it away. It means you keep navigating it, okay? Because so, these are not linear steps. It's not a specific order that you follow every single time. You go back, you pick up what you need to look at, and you kind of go through it again. Okay, so there's a link there to my openness worksheet, which I'm not going to spend much time on right now, but I'm just going to say to you, there'll be some resources that if um, you'll get when you get the, the webinar um, and the PowerPoint that will have a worksheet that I created for working with the people I've worked with in terms of adoption. So whether it's birth parents, adopt parents, adoptees, or siblings. So when you get that worksheet, what my encouragement is for anybody who's on here from the guardian program or case manager, or whatnot, take it back to your team, take that as a sample modify it, make it your own. How are you going to integrate this into, you know, your planning when you work with kids? Maria Batista, how am I doing for time? Good. Yep. You're doing great. 
All right, awesome. So um, language and mediated settlement agreements at TPR and consent. Um, so here are some questions that I brought um, that came up to me as I look at them. So I will give you, um, you know, I've, and these are based upon actual facts from some of my clients, right? So were the parents and the caregivers prepared for the mediation and the commitment to open contact that they agreed to? So it has absolutely been my experience that foster parents don't have attorneys, adoption attorneys during the process until we get to the last minute of the finalization. And so nobody has actually discussed with them as their attorney about the rules related to this. And I think a lot of times our case managers aren't even aware of what is that statute we're talking about, right? So there's some generalizations about it, but they may find themselves in a room or in a conversation that says, okay, well, there's bio parents willing to consent to this. This will make this move forward quicker. And, um, but they want you to agree to every other week visits, you know, um, holidays, birthday parties, whatever that might look like. And, um, and, and so I've had clients that come to me and said, I didn't even realize that was happening before it was already done. And then I didn't know what to do. And I went ahead and signed for it. Right. Um, and so if they weren't, I guess the question for those of us who work in this area is how do we assist them after the commitment has been made? Right. So for those of you who are private attorneys out there, how do you do that? Or, you know, is by talking to your client about this is the statute this is what happens. This mediated settlement agreement is going to be incorporated into your final judgment. If there's a shift in that, because what you identify as, you know, your child's best interest has changed, then you can modify it. You know, obviously if you have open relationship, you should be talking to the other parent, you know, the, the birth parents about it and what that might look like. Sometimes you might have to go to court and figure that out. Um, here's another one I see, and I always find this fascinating. So I had a client who, <laughs> who were adoptive parents, but not the child's foster parents, right? And sometimes you remember in the system, adoption's the afterthought, right? We work in a system where the priority is to keep kids safe. So sometimes when we get to adoption, it just kind of feels like boom, 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 it's all tidied up and we're done and we're out, right? It's because the child's in a, in a safe place, right? But um, if there was a mediated settlement agreement and the agency signed to the you know, language talking about that they would um, identify a prospective adoptive families that would maintain the level of openness that they are committing to this birth parent, right? Then what is the agency's duty to ensure that that happens? And I see that fall down a lot of times. So I had a family who was very, very open, thankfully, when I got the consent packet, I see the mediated settlement agreement. I call my clients and I say, did you know about this? And they said, we've never heard about this ever once. We were never given a copy of this, what the contact should be, you know, how it should be maintained. So we had to go over it. It is my view that if the agency has signed that, then they are taking on that responsibility and they need to incorporate this into their planning. And as you are interviewing or considering and doing your disclosure meetings, match meetings and such with prospective adopted families, you need to discuss this. So it's as simple as saying we have a mediated settlement agreement. We need to copy the language from that. We need to put it in a checklist so that goes in the child's file. And every time you're looking at a possible match for that child, you need to have that consideration. Um, is this the responsibility of the post-adoption team? So that is after adoption, right? So we have a mediated settlement agreement. So then what happens if the adoption is finalized? Who helps the family navigate it after the fact? So my view, yes, this is the responsibility of the post-adoption team. They should be out there helping families navigate when there's an agreement that they've absolutely been a part of to figure out how to maintain contact, how to handle break breakdowns that might occur. Um, we talked about the next one. Um, so what happened if the adoption attorney does not add this into the petition and final judgment? So if there's a mediated settlement agreement that is signed that says it will be incorporated into the final judgment of adoption and the adoption attorney doesn't do that, so who is at fault? So if the agency is sending that mediated settlement agreement, 
you know, it will likely be on your attorney to make sure that they do incorporate that in there. But I have worked with a lot of attorneys who weren't even familiar with what that mediated settlement agreement is. So I think from a best practice perspective, we also have to look again, the agency should be helping make sure that we agree to some kind of contact that it gets maintained, that it gets incorporated into the final judgment. The, the guardian can help do that and the court can help do that, right? So what is the judge's responsibility in this case? If they presided over um, the, the TPR and aware of the mediated settlement agreement, is it the court's responsibility to take a look to make sure is that incorporated in the final judgment, right? Can we correct it after the fact? So these are questions that you can take back to your team to say, how do we manage this and make sure that this context stays in place? That's related to mediated settlement agreements, but there's also just the general concept of how do you um, how do you maintain the contact that people are agreeing to, and we see that more so in sibling relationships, especially as these new statutes have come over the last few years, requiring finding family, requiring siblings to maintain contact. Okay. So I think we're going to bring it back, Maria Batista, back to our panelists. Um, and talking about resolving and reducing breakdowns. Am I correct? You are correct. So uh, last offer, um, if you guys have any questions, feel free to drop it in the chat. I did want to mention, Maria, I think what you mentioned earlier about adoptive children not knowing other adoptive children, I think that's why I love Florida You Shine so much because when I was adopted, I did not know anybody else who was adopted besides my own uh, siblings, my parents adopted as well, but my first one when I was 19 years old um, with Body Shine. So panelists, now I'm gonna go ahead over to you and in your experience, what are some trouble spots where breakdowns in communication and relationships are likely to occur? Nikki, we're gonna go ahead and start with you. I think the biggest breakdown of communication is hurt feelings. We are all only human and hurt feelings of split time will undoubtedly sneak in. They have at our house. But although my boys tease me all the time about my three hour lectures, I feel it's important that we just keep talking through the hurt feelings and through all the uncomfortableness because th these aren't easy topics to discuss. I have to show them and teach them how to be safe and to be an appropriate um, or have an appropriate way to process any feelings that they are feeling. And then it's my job to explain to them that money and frivolous gifts does not equal love or family. DNA does not make a family, but love does. And I consider us all to be the new modern family. We're busy and complicated and full of love. I love that. I love how you say modern family. I think it's so cute. Um, okay, LaShawn, over to you. Same question. Do you have anything that you wanted to talk about in your experience? All right. So um, when one party is advocating for context and the other is not, um, that can cause trust issues. Um, when one side of the argument is miscommunicated by the other party, it can lead to miscommunication of understanding each other. Um, I can give, a, a, for instance, if somebody isn't expressing their idea clearly, and the other side just assumes that um, what they're trying to say, then that can lead to a miscommunication as well. Yeah, no, miscommunication definitely does happen. Thank you for that, LaShawn. Byron, now over to you. Of course, of course. Um, one thing that I, or a couple of things I should say um, that it's kind of like a breakdown in the communication or relationships is that um, an example would be when biological parents are able to admit their own faults. Um, and so, for example, um, when birth parents don't realize that their kids aren't legally theirs anymore and that um, the parents slash parents that are raising their kids do have value. Um, and so there shouldn't be times when um, the bio parents um, would have to tell an adoptive parent that they're, that they're going to do something without proper, proper approval. And so an example of that would be um, asking a child to ask their adoptive parent to go on a specific trip. Um, and so I think that that altercation between the biological parent and the child um, 
kind of shows the disrespect towards the adoptive parent uh, because um, things like that should be discussed with parents overall. Not having the child be a moderator between the two is probably one of the more disrespectful things to do um, regarding that situation. Um, and so I think that's a breakdown within, uh, a possible breakdown within um, the communication between adoptive parents or adoptive families and then birth parents. Yes, and I love how you mentioned about having the child being the mediator between the bio parents and the adoptive parents. It's not the child's responsibility to be that mediator because they want to be a child. So thank you to all my panelists um, for going and answering that question. We're now going to go ahead and turn it back to Maria Bates for identifying some common breakdowns. And you're on mute, Maria. All right, I'm off mute. Um, so there was a few things that you just mentioned that I really want to highlight, right? So, um, and these are very, very common issues. So the hurt feelings and fears, um, you know, I, I can't stress enough how, how important communication is, right? Um, and, and putting the child in the middle, this happens in divorce cases all the times, right? I mean, in some ways, the way that there's the, um, the shift from biological parents to adoptive parents, there's some common experiences that look very similar to contested divorces, right? Where the child actually gets in the middle of it because the parents aren't communicating with each other. So really successful open adoptions and open contact is about building real relationships. It's not about a checklist of somebody gets a visit or somebody doesn't get a visit. It's about the birth parent and the adoptive parent developing a direct relationship, developing direct communication, right? So um, that they do talk with each other, even when they may both have their own fears and both have their own perspectives and both have concerns about it, right? So, so sometimes, you know, sometimes our kids do that, like, I have experienced that where my kids triangulate a little bit, right? So that their birth mom would allow certain things and I wouldn't allow certain things or vice versa. And they sort of use that being in the middle to help them get what they want, right? That's what kids do. We all do it, right? Even adults do it. Um, but the importance here is to, again, come back to the space of developing direct relationships between the adults, right? So that the kid is not in the middle when it's especially something fearful or negative or, you know, putting that pressure on them, right? We parentify our kids in care too much anyhow, right? Like a big part of it is helping our kids become and be kids again, right? So um, her feelings and fears, feelings of failure. So sometimes what I see in, in open adoptions and some of the breakdowns is that the birth parents have a hard time acknowledging their different role because they feel like they're failed their kids. And it's, it's one thing, you know, um, but when they, when they have to own that, I mean, so to take responsibility for something, sometimes you have to own that there's a sense of, I didn't, I wasn't a good enough parent. And that's a lot, that's a heavy burden to carry from a parent. When again, sometimes it's a capacity issue. Sometimes it's a generational foster care issue. Sometimes it's poverty related. Sometimes it's all of these things layered on, but the minute it becomes just, you're a failed person, you're a failed parent, then sometimes they attach to this, fat, this, this concept that the real family will always be the only real family. So when Byron mentioned the value that the adoptive parents have in a child's life, sometimes it's hard to recognize that because if I recognize that, then I may mean I failed, that I really did fail. So that's not true for everybody. What I'm saying is you see how we can break down and pull these, these layers of the onion back and get to some of these core feelings and hurt and issues and, and fears. So that helps us understand better where the other person is coming from, which I think is missed all the time, right? Because we're busy. We're busy and we're trying to navigate this. And just as, you know, Nikki and Byron said, like they're on call sometimes for the sister to get taken to and from jobs. She lives in a world where maybe there's not a plan about that. So for somebody who's a planner, that's harder, 
Like I'm a planner. I want to plan things out. I have had to learn how to be less of a planner. And that's actually been great for my kids too, right? So there's all different ways to live. Um, some other common issues, and I'm just kind of bringing back some things that everybody's already said, which is worrying about others even when you aren't with them. Our kids worry about their birth parents. They absolutely worry about their siblings. And if they go to a new placement, they also worry about who they left behind in their former caregiver, their for, former foster parent. They worry about us. Adoptive parents worry about our kids. You know, adoptive parents in many ways have this layer of, I have to be better. I have to be a better parent. Like it's, it's so much, hard. and like you have to have all the answers, but literally you don't. Like you can just be a parent too, okay? But the common occurrence and common concern is just worrying about um, others, even when you aren't with them. Um, uh, I mentioned it before, but very few people understand beyond the few of you who are living this, what's actually going on. A very common issue. So, um, you know, in my experience, the majority of breakdowns happen because there's not trust in the relationship. If I could actually, like, if we had a ropes course, right, for birth and adoptive families, it could solve a whole lot, right? You go to work, you go to team building exercises, right? Because you build up your team. Do we ever do that with birth and adoptive and foster and kin and all these people? No. In fact, we keep them all separated, right? And we keep them separated by check boxes, like, hey, you know, we just need to check box this off. We're going to do an MDT. We're going to do a staffing. We're going to do this. We're going to go permanency hearing. I think most people don't even know what those things are, right? But those things segregate, okay? So it would be great if we can all come together. And that is one of the core tools, I think, that we need, it is underutilized, is there's tremendous amount of team building related work out there and literature and research. And why is that not being used in the adoption arena, it, in foster care arena? It absolutely should be. We've already talked about some of the other tools like agreements, um, you know, technology, you know, I have found that I like texting, you know, with, um, with birth family, because honestly, I, you know, I remember when my kids were little and like mom was having a hard time. She was like, could you just send me a picture? And I'm like, yeah, here you go. Right. And sometimes that was just that little thing that was so simple that could immediately, she could reach out to me and I could immediately respond to her, helped her helped her process it instead of her carrying the weight of that for a long time and me carrying the weight of waiting till the end of the year to send a whole bunch of pictures together and, a le and one letter that says everything about what this my child has gone through in the last year. That's a whole lot of pressure also on the adoptive family, right? So, you know, coming together, figuring out the communications, using that technology, Putting kind of, an, whether you have a, call it an agreement, a formal agreement or promises, a statement of, like your vows, right? If we go back to the concept of the marriage, right? Your vows to each other, kind of developing that together could be an unbelievably helpful way of reducing breakdowns. Like the ring you wear when you get married, right? Sometimes it's a reminder that yes, in fact, you're married, right? So in the same way, if you can create those vows to each other, that puts the child at the center, it's easier to focus back on that when there is a breakdown. You know what? We all love this child. You show it differently than I show it. Your need for communication is different from my need from it. My ability to, you know, be spontaneous versus being structured versus, you know, living in this different kind of world. I mean, I live in a different world. I can't change that. It's the world I grew up in. It's different than your world, but I can try to understand it. Right. So again, that tool of creating your statements of understanding, like coming up with something that is your vows to each other is super helpful in resolving, reducing breakdowns. Um, also talking to your others, we've mentioned these things before, therapists, friends, trusted advisor, other adoptive parents, other adoptees, Florida Youth Shine is just amazing. It really is a family. Attorneys and advocates, you can read, read, read. There's great literature out there on open adoption, even though a lot of it is focused on private, the private adoption world, you still can get a lot of good information out of it, right? A lot. 
And there has to be more trainings like this. And there has to be more people, uh, more of our, our kids just standing up. And I don't mean to call Byron, LaShawn and Sean kids because they're not kids, they're young people, young adults. And, and but their voices are so much more important than mine and everybody else's. Um, and so we've got to listen to them and what matters to them. As a parent, we don't always agree. We don't always follow what they say, but if we listen a whole lot more, we're going to get to the basis of it more and recognize what truly is important to them. Um, and I think we underestimate all the time the value and importance of these relationships. And it's not just a one-sided, just my bio family. It is about the relationships that they identify as important to them. Okay, um, I am going to share this screen real quick. Um, there we go. Okay, ethics and advocacy. Um, and we're only gonna spend a few minutes on that because we wanna open up the floor for, for Q and A um, and final thoughts after this. But um, I, if you can't tell, I'm a huge advocate of open adoption. Um, and I get it doesn't always work in the way we talk about it working and, and that's okay. I mean, it's, it's, I've had my own ups and downs with it, but it's still important to bring it, bring it up to the, you know, out on the table and talk about it and figure out how you can make it work. Um, and so I guess my question first for you is, should you promote open contact? My answer is yes. Um, and I think we'll, we'll, we open this up after I say these things, but I think the, the panelists can also then share what their view on it is too. Um, for those of you who are working in a system and you're working with clients, so whether you're a private attorney and it's your clients or it's the guardian or, you know, anybody, um, trying to assess whether somebody is telling the truth and whether their commitment is true. Like if they say, yes, I'm going to do this. Well, will they keep that up? Um, is an individualized assessment. I mean, sometimes you just have to see it happen, right? We have to see the visits to see whether or not they're going to um, maintain the visits. We have to see how people operate in those visits. And as practitioners or, or professionals, we have to help them prepare for it better, right? So sometimes we do rush to judgment on things because we, we view it from our lens, from our own internal bias, right? And so if you already have an internal bias that bio parents shouldn't have contact or siblings shouldn't have contact because it's gonna disrupt something, you know, or they, they have their children move so they shouldn't have the right of open contact, you know, that filter, that bias you have is going to be layered onto every case that you work with. So, you know, first is to identify what bias you have, but then next you need to get in there and kind of watch it and then train and teach your families, your clients about it, and then see how they operate. And again, don't rush to judgment because underneath what they're doing or saying just really could be fear. Um, Florida is not an open record state, but many other states are moving to this concept of open records. So if you learn it all about open adoption, this, this the collapsing of these concepts of open records, which is that, instead of having closed adoptions, right? So when an adoption finalizes, we seal the original birth certificate and we create a brand new birth certificate listing the adoptive parent or parents as the parents to the child. It looks like the original birth certificate. For adoptions that are closed, that nobody, you know, the adoptive family and the birth family don't know each other, the child doesn't know, there's been a whole movement that's come that says a child has the right to know they have the right to know who their biological family is, and they have the right to have that original birth certificate, and they have the right to have those open records. Um, and Flores Children First has a whole um, um, document um, on also accessing your your records in the system, um, which we can get you that link if you if you want to to learn more about that. But it this Florida is not quite yet an open record state. There is movement afoot, but it um, it is about unsealing those records so that that our kids have the knowledge of who their um, birth family is. So um, when are we including the child's voice and how, as I've already said, I'm a huge advocate of having every child have an attorney ad litem and um, having their voice be heard. Um, and I think that there's value in, in having a guardian and an attorney because the child's voice should be amplified in the courtroom. And I think it's, um, uh, how to integrate some of these statutory requirements and the media settlement grants have already addressed, like the judge can open it up. 
The magistrate can open up that conversation. The child's not in court. That's okay. Go have them fill out a form directly that they can submit to the court about this, right? It doesn't have to be through the case manager's viewpoint or the guardian's viewpoint. It can be directly, here's a form that we've come up with to help you tell us how you feel about contact with your family. You know, here's this worksheet that asks you some questions about what does openness mean to you? Who would you like to have a relationship? What are your thoughts on this? What are your fears about this, right? Um, so there's a lot of ways that the child's voice could be incorporated into the process and directly with, without interpretation or layers of, of you know, personal feelings or bias um, for all of those us who sit in the middle. Um, and then clearly you can advocate for statutes and regulations and operating procedures and forms to be modified, created um, a new legislation. One of the things that I think Florida Youth Shine is unbelievable in is advocating um, for changes in the system. And I know that this is one, you know, sibling relationships is one of their priorities. Um, and so I, I invite them to also share about that. Um, and here are my final thoughts, and then I'm just going to turn it over to the panelists um, for our last um, 15 minutes together, which is, um, again, try to understand others' views, and most importantly, the child's view. Be kind to yourself and to those in the process. It is not easy all the time. Or just build your support team and knowledge and think expansively about what family means. Just like a marriage where we're joining two non-biological people and their families, adoption can be exactly that as well. Expansive, right? And even if it's not adoption, it's permanent guardianship or relative caregiver status or fostering or whatever that looks like. Because if a child is in a home with a foster parent or in group homes or whatever that looks like for more than a few months of time period, they are building relationships that becomes their normal, that is their normalcy. And why can't we maintain those relationships for them? You know, we don't, we don't need to put barriers up for them. Those are my thoughts. Now I'm gonna turn it over to Maria Batista. Thank you for that, Maria Bates. Uh, so panelists, before we go ahead, I have a few questions and a compliment for you all. Um, do you guys have any final thoughts that you'd like to share with us? Nikki, see, oh, Byron, go. I was gonna say nothing. I was like, I'm all good. I am, I'm good as well. Perfect, so then no, so no final thoughts. I'll give my final thoughts. I agree with you, Maria Bates, as she mentioned, Florida, Florida you shine, sibling connections and after adoptions, post adoptions, moving out of foster care, being reunified, they are a priority for us because we enter care with our siblings and we don't know anybody else but our siblings so it's one of those things i want to know who my sibling is and i want to know they're safe if i if they're getting fed and they're getting talked to and they're doing well in school those are the things that you know we think about constantly like byron said when he was taken uh, from the shine you think about that and really no child should have to think about that constantly about the fear and the safety of their of their siblings so thank you for that and thank you to my panelists so we have the first question. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the enforceability of an agreement for contact post-adoption? What recourse is available for a party who is being denied contact that is agreed upon by the adoptive parent? Maria Bates, I think this is probably a question for you. Yep, um, let me just um, see if I can. Um, just trying to pull up that slide again with the, um, the statute on it, but because the statute is where you want to look, is there enforceability or not enforceability, right? So um, here is it. Here we go. So um, I have to. Um, Notwithstanding the statute, the adoptive parent may at any time petition for a review of a communication or contact order entered pursuant to subsection one, if the apparent believes that the best interests of the adopted child are being compromised, and the court may order the communication or contact to be terminated or modified, as the court deems to be in the best interest of the adopted child. However, it cannot be increased um, without their agreement. As part of the review process, the court may order the parties to engage in mediation. I have never seen this tested. 
and I don't know if Robin can, um, you know, if she has seen that uh, tested as well, but I have never seen this tested personally. Um, and again, this statute is related to only when the adoption is pursuant to a former chapter 39 case, right? So if it's just a post-adoption contract on a private adoption, it's different. There could be an argument just based upon contract law um, that you would go forward with it. But my steps I would see would be taking it to your post-adoption team, right? So if a birth parent is concerned it's not being followed, if a child is being concerned it's not being followed, then take it to the post-adoption team, see if they can help you navigate that write a letter to the court, right? Um, something to open that back up for there to be scrutiny. Again, the most common thing that's going to happen is a two mediation first, right? And so then on, the reality here is, do the, do the parents have, um, who's responsible for paying for that mediation, right? So if there wasn't a mediated settlement agreement, it was a private agreement between the two parties, then I doubt very well that it's going to be, um, you know, brought open to court and that the system will pay for that mediation. But I think you can absolutely advocate for the post-adoption support team to help you navigate that. And even if they don't know what they're doing, if they've never had to do that before, just say, we need your help and make it, you know, important to them. Um, I would love to see this be more formalized. So if there's a breakdown in communication, what do we do? And the post-adoption team has sort of Here's a question. Here's a questionnaire we've come up with. What's happening here? How can we help facilitate this? Um, and and then kind of bring the parties back together to to get a sense of it and you know mediate it from accounts more from a counseling perspective than a legal perspective, right? Because again, you're building relationships. If you have a mediated settlement agreement, I think you look to the terms of that agreement, and if it's incorporated in the final judgment, you can you know try to take it to court. I just have not seen it yet. I hope we see more of it if, this, if the breakdowns are occurring so that we can create a process because unfortunately sometimes processes aren't created until a lawsuit occurs. And I don't know if Robin has any other experience or there's other attorneys um, watching who wants to add to that. No, but thanks for asking Maria. Perfect. So um, I have a compliment. So I must compliment all these young gentlemen. I interview candidates for positions in healthcare, and I am starved for their warmth, openness, candor, and confidence in candidates today. It is too forward for me to suggest they all consider working in some capacity in healthcare. This is the type of communication patients need. Please believe me when I tell you how incredibly professional and mature you all are. Every parent wants their child to shine, meet their challenges and difficulties so well, excel at presenting themselves and adjusting to even the most trying moments. Just a compliment. So huge congratulations to you all. Um, last call for questions if anybody has any. Well, I will say that um, I've always, um, I, I've been rallying behind the scenes to say, we need to have a pilot project in the state of Florida on this. We need to take it to one of our courts or several of our courts to see how it might work in different jurisdictions. I would love to see post-adoption teams spearheading this, the guardian, whoever else um, can, can jump on this bandwagon. But listen, we have the law now that says sibling contacts are priority. Why aren't we coming up with easy solutions, right? So you know, even helping train foster parents on FaceTime or Zoom or things like that to maintain contact. How do we develop relationships while we're still in the case and we have everybody's attention? You know, um, I would love to see some pilot projects. So if any of you watching is an attorney, a judge, a somebody who has the ability to maybe you know, light some fire and say, let's make this happen, then I am all for it. And you are welcome to reach out to me directly. Um, to put something together because I think it's very much, very much needed for our kids and our families. Because, you know, when we look at healing that happens, it's not just about this one event. If we can help one full family heal on this, we are reducing generational foster care, 100%. Okay, I just you. wanna thank um, all of the panelists on behalf of Florida's Children First, really um, Youth Shine and the members of Youth Shine 
your participation and helping people understand the reality of the issue is just critical. And thank you again, Maria Bates. Um, Maria is our go-to expert in assisting families with adoption issues. The prior two trainings and this training will be um, on the Florida Legal Services YouTube channel. Florida Legal Services. And I also encourage attorneys and judges to join the Florida Dependency Law Center. Florida Dependency Law Center. I put the, um, the URL in the chat. Um, if you need a certificate of attendance, either as a GAL or a foster parent or for your work, email Alexis Alvarez. She put her contact information in the chat and she will send you out that certificate. Attorneys, the information that you need to get the CLEs is um, also included in the email. So uh, in the chat. Um, thank you everyone. We really appreciate your participation and it's great to see you all virtually online. Well, and I echo everything that was said here today and also want to thank you uh, for sharing your experiences and your knowledge with us. And, you know, Maria, you said we need more trainings on this. Anytime that I can support you and get these trainings out here, you just reach right out to me and we'll make it happen. Um, so with that, I'm going to stop the recording and stop.